Even though this lecture is about breach of trusts, we're also going to spend a lot of time focusing on remedies as well. And that makes sense because if there has been a breach of trust by, say, a trustee or a third party, then the beneficiary is going to want to be able to take action. That means we're going to be looking at things like accounting for profits and even tracing, which can be quite complicated. But first of all, we need to understand what type of remedies are actually available. So with that in mind, let's get started. The first type of remedy is that that exists in REM, in other words, a remedy that is available in respect of property. Remember that the key in this area is that you're trying to get the property back that belongs to the trust, and so a remedy in REM is normally the first place you'll go. However, remedies are also available in personam, and this is a remedy that exists in respect of a person. This is probably most likely to come up when a trustee has breached their duty of care, and the beneficiaries want to take action against that negligent trustee. There are also a couple of types of breach as well. The first type of breach is where the trustee does something that they are not entitled to. So normally within the trust instrument, there's sort of rules which are set out for the trustee. They may invest in these certain type of companies, but they may not invest in other types of companies, that sort of thing. And so if the trustee does something that they're not entitled to, that falls under the first type of breach. On the other hand, if the trustee does something that they are entitled to, but does so in a negligent fashion, then that is really the second type of breach. So how does this relate back to the remedies? Well, where the trustee does something they're not entitled to, i.e. the first type of breach, we can bring a case of falsifying the account. And what happens here is instead of it being treated as trust property, which has actually been taken out of the trust, the money or the property that the trustee uses is basically treated by the courts as their own money, i.e. that belonging to the trustee. And so now the trustee has to give back to the trust what is missing. And that comes originally from Nocton and Lord Ashburton from 1914. So let's try and explain that a little bit better with an example. We have the trust fund there and maybe they're buying stock in a company which they're not allowed to. Say, for example, the trust instrument says you can only invest in companies based in the UK and the trustee uses the money to invest in a company that's based overseas. Well, the little trick of the court in this situation is that rather than this being seen as the trust that's buying the stock in the company, it's actually seen that the trustee is using their own money to buy the stock instead. So the result of this is that the trustee then has to give that money or the equivalent back to the trust in order to settle the account. Moving on, and we've also got that second type of breach, which you will remember is where the tr trustee does something that they are allowed to do, but they do it in a negligent fashion. In this type of situation, consideration has to be given to where the trust would be if the trustee had actually exercised due diligence and been careful, and more importantly than anything, not be negligent. Now, as we're dealing with negligence, those of you who've already studied tort law will know that there is an element of causation here. So in the case of Target Holdings and Red Ferns from 1995, we had a situation where the trustees hadn't actually caused the loss to the fund, and so they were not liable. So important that we consider that causation, um, but let's have a look at surcharging the account. So we have another example here and we've got our two trust funds on the left. Now, in the first situation at the top of the screen, you can see that there has been negligence because the stocks have gone down. Now, this might just not... Remember, we need to get an understanding of what negligence is, so make sure you go back and check out the previous lecture on the powers and duties of trustees. This isn't necessarily just a bad investment, but it's more about the trustees doing something like taking bad advice or ignoring expert advice. So in this situation, um, we've got the money going down. Second type of situation where if the trustee had been um, careful, then the money would have gone up. And so what we're trying to do in this situation to actually get to the remedy is to account for the difference between those two sums. So uh, to give you a practical example, say the trust fund starts off at £10,000. Because of the negligence, it goes down to £9,000 but if it, they had been careful, it would have gone up to £11,000. That difference between the nine and £11,000 is £2,000. 
and so the trustee would be liable for that £2,000. Meanwhile, we, the trustee may also be accountable for the profits that they've made as well. General rule is that trustees are not allowed to sort of make a profit from being a trustee. Um, and so if there's wrongful use of the trust property, there may be a personal remedy against them. But what is more likely to happen in this situation is that the profits themselves are held on a constructive trust for the beneficiaries. In other words, because the trustee has made this profit because of the trust, the profits are considered as belonging to the trust. And so we have this constructive trust that the courts use to basically bring the profits back to the trust fund. And this is more of a proprietary remedy rather than a remedy against the trustees themselves. It originates from Keach and Sanford in 1726, but the more modern idea of using a constructive trust in relation to profits comes from Boardman and Phipps from 1967. So we're going to move on a little bit now. So far we've mainly talked about breaches of trust that have been committed by the trustee themselves, but it's also possible that a third party may be liable for a breach of trust. For example, we might have a situation where there is a car which is trust property, and the trustee takes that car and sells it on to somebody else, a third party. Now, is that third party then liable to give that property, the car, back to the trust fund. Some situations that might seem a little bit unfair. So we have these rules relating to dishonest receipt and if a third party does receive trust property um, that they shouldn't have got then they do have to return it in two types of situations. Firstly if they received it as a gift and this comes back to the equitable maxim that equity will not assist a volunteer. The other type of situation is a little bit more controversial Basically, if the third party had knowledge that there has been a breach of trust and that would make it unconscionable for them to retain the benefit, then they would also have to return the trust property in that situation as well. So there's obviously a little bit of um, controversy over whether it is unconscionable or not and what exactly constitutes the third party's knowledge. Um, but that's the basic rule that we have from Lord Justice Norse in Bank of Credit and Commerce International and Akindele from 2001. Important that we get that idea of unconscionability out because suspicion is not enough and that comes from the case of Abu Rama from 2006. Meanwhile, we also have the idea of third parties who assist in a breach. So if we go back to our example of somebody who um, may be has that car which is in relation to the trust property and a third party helps to find a buyer for the car and they earn a commission of say a hundred pounds well this third party while they've not got the trust property itself they've actually made a profit or a commission from um, in relation to the trust so what happens to that money well they may in the first place be liable to account for any profit so that 100 pounds may be taken as part of a constructive trust and the £100 would then be returned to the trust fund. They can also be liable in equity if they are considered to be dishonest though, but the meaning of dishonesty has been subject to some serious questions in recent years throughout the courts. So the traditional definition of dishonesty comes from Twin Sectra and Yardley from 2002 and basically says that the third party will be dishonest if by reasonable standards they realise that their conduct was dishonest. And I've underlined two key words there. Firstly, by reasonable standards, because that talks about sort of a more objective approach to dishonesty. And then realised, because this talks about more of a subjective approach. In other words, looking at the defendant's attitude themselves. So the traditional definition takes objective and subjective standards, but this has really been rejected to a great extent in recent years, most notably in this area of law in the case of Barlow Close, which moves much closer to an objective standard. And even though it is an objective test, it basically accounts for certain subjective factors. So it doesn't completely contradict Twin Sectra and Yardley, but it does move us towards a more objective approach. If you're answering an essay question in this area, I would also recommend that you look at some of the other cases on dishonesty, 
in particular the recent case from last year of Ivy and Genting Casinos, which I did a podcast episode on. Even though it's a slightly different context, it tells you a lot about how the courts approach the question of dishonesty. Injunctions I don't really want to talk about too much because they're more of a general remedy, and this would really be used in anticipation of a breach, whereas the focus for this lecture is where a breach has actually already occurred. So something to be aware of that this is a possible remedy, but don't, we're not going to focus on it too much now. Tracing is often considered to be quite a difficult area for students, but as long as we follow some of the basic rules, then it shouldn't be too difficult. And we retain this key idea, which we have sort of hinted at at the start of this lecture, that basically all you're trying to do is follow the property, and then the person who ends up with that property is considered to be a constructive trustee. In other words, the property leaves the trust, ends up with someone else, and that someone else then holds that property on constructive trust so it can return back to the original trust. However, the point of tracing is that it's not automatic and a lot of students forget that um, they actually need to identify whether tracing can actually occur. Now, an example here would be that if the funds are mixed and then the person who's taken the funds goes bankrupt, then it's seen that the funds have completely disappeared and so tracing will not be possible. So there are four preliminary requirements before we can actually get into the tracing itself. Firstly, there has to be the existence of a fiduciary relationship. This is normally quite easy because we're just talking about, say, a trustee and a beneficiary. There has to be the existence of an equitable proprietary right. In other words, is there property that exists within a trust? So again, something that's normally fairly easy to satisfy. Would, is the tracing process itself equitable? In the case of Reed Diplock, 1948, it's quite a sort of funny case if you get a chance to read it. Basically, um, the money came from a will and was paid out towards a charity, in particular an orphanage, and they used that money then to build a roof for their orphanage. It turned out that the clause used in the will was wrong, and so when they tried to trace it and get the money back, and um, basically they were trying to literally take the roof off an orphanage, but um, I think that was uh, considered to the, by the courts to not exactly be equitable in that situation. Finally, the property actually has to be in the form in which it can be traced. So we've already talked about this previously when we said about sort of someone who goes bankrupt, the money is said to have disappeared. A more common example might be if you if the money is spent on something which cannot then be traced, something like a holiday, for example. Whereas if you invest in, say, a car or property, that is a physical object that can be traced. If it's just spent on a holiday, then you, can, you can't really trace that money back. Um, and so the money is considered to be lost. So we've got those basic ideas. Now we can get into the rules of tracing. The first rule is that when money is withdrawn from an account, the trustee is presumed to be spending their own money in the first instance. We'll see an example at the moment, in a moment, but that idea comes from Re Hallett's estate in 1880. Now, once it goes beyond the trustee's own money, um, it's considered to actually come from the trust itself, but then later repayments into the account are not exactly repayments to the trust unless that is specifically stated by the trustee. Roscoe and Winder is the case for that from 1915. So what do we actually mean by this and can we sort of get an example? Well, here we have a mixed account and at the top we've got the trustee's own money um, which they are sort of free to spend and do what they like with. So they've got £5,000 there that's in green Underneath that, we've got the trust money, which is £10,000. So we've got £15,000 in total, and I've put that in red or reddish pink, um, basically saying that this shouldn't really be touched. Nevertheless, what we're going to do is we're going to have £8,000 taken out. And we can see that this isn't a proportional takeout. We, remember, we take out the trustee's money first, and only after that, we take out money from the trust fund. So the trustee loses all £5,000 of their own money, and then he dips into the trust fund. £2,000 is taken out of that, and so the trust fund is left with £8,000 um, in total. Now, what happens then if, say, money is put back in by the trustee? Well, in that situation, 
the, all of the money is considered to belong to the trustee. So he goes up to £5,000, but you'll notice the important thing is that at the bottom of the screen, the trust fund has not gone back up to £10,000. Instead, it stays stationary at £8,000. All of that £5,000 is considered to belong to the trustee once they put that money back in. The second rule of tracing is that if a mixed fund is used to purchase property, the beneficiaries have first charge over that property. And this is really important. And according to Foskett and McCone from 2001, the beneficiaries are given a couple of options, which essentially guarantees that they're not going to lose money. So if the property increases in value, they can take their portion of it. And if it decreases in value, they can just retain the original sum. So again, useful to look at an example. We can see this property, this lovely property by the beach here, was bought for £100,000. £50,000 is from the trustee's own money, um, but we also have this mix-in of the trust fund money, and £50,000 comes from that. So in terms of proportions, we've kept it very simple here, it's just 50-50. Now, say the property increases in value and it goes up to £200,000, well, the beneficiaries get their proportion, which remember is 50%. And so rather than just getting their original £50,000 back, it would actually increase in value in line with the increase in value of the property. And so they would instead get £100,000. Now, what if our lovely property here by the beach falls into the sea and it actually the land go, value goes down to £10,000? Well, in that situation, like I said earlier, the beneficiaries are not going to lose any money, and so instead they would just get back their original sum of £50,000. Now, the property would be sold, the money would sort of um, go to the trustee, but then the trustee would be expected to reimburse the trust, trust fund with the £50,000. Finally, the rule of tracing is where, the final rule of tracing is where money is mixed into an account from two trusts, so say trust A and trust B, Tracing operates on the principle of first in and first out. Originally, that was discussed in 1816 in the case of Clayton's case, um, but it's also been looked at in the case of Barlow Close and Vaughan from 1992. Definitely worth looking at that. And also, it's definitely worth looking at some of the criticism of this rule as well. I'll give you a brief idea about that criticism in the next slide, um, but worth bearing that in mind. So what do we mean by first in and first out? Well, the best way to imagine it is to consider a container like this. Uh, money flows in at the top. It sort of sinks to the bottom um, like gra with gravity and stuff. And then it flows out through the bottom. And this is based on when the money is actually put into the account. So say on the first of the month, £40,000 goes into it from Trust A. And that sinks to the bottom of our little container there. And then on the second of month, say the following day, we get the mix of the trust fund. So we get the money from Trust B, which goes in. So we've got £60,000 from Trust B. And that gives us a total of £100,000 in the account. So the question that often comes up in relation to tracing is what happens when money is taken out of this joint account? And we're going to take quite a significant sum. We're going to take £80,000 out and we'll see what happens. So £80,000 goes and because, like we said, it flows out from the bottom, we can see that all of Trust A's £40,000 is gone, as well as part of Trust B's £60,000. But the important thing is that once the trust, the account money has gone from £100,000 down to £20,000, all of that £20,000 now belongs to Trust B. And this probably gives you a sense of why some people consider this rule to be very unfair. And that's because Trust A has lost out completely simply because the money was put into the account the day before. And so there's been a lot of um, debate about around that. And as I say, it's worth looking at that case of Barlow Close um, it, it, because that provides an exception for the courts. And it's probably likely that the courts would again try and find an exception to Clayton's case, even though that is technically still the law of the land. So some final things to consider in relation to breaches of trust. Trustee may be able to avoid liability. We looked at this in the previous lecture when we looked at powers and duties of trustees. 
If a beneficiary then also contributes to the breach of trust, then their interest, in other words, their attempt to retain the property, may actually be held back as part of a constructive trust itself in order to compensate the other innocent beneficiaries. And talking about beneficiaries who sort of get in trouble and um, contribute to the breach itself, if a beneficiary consents to a breach of trust, then they cannot then go back on their word and then sue after the fact. So hopefully that gives you some of the basic ideas around breach of trust. If this comes up as part of an essay question, you will want to go ahead and do some of your own research, in particular on some of the controversial topics such as the meaning of dishonesty within this area of the law, and also some of the areas pertaining to tracing. If this comes up as part of a problem question, the first step is to identify the actual breach of trust. A lot of students tend to forget this, and this is quite easy marks. Secondly, identify the type of breach that we're talking about, and then go on to consider some of the remedies afterwards. With tracing, this can get a little bit complicated, but remember you're just trying to sort of follow the property and apply the rules that we talked about. Even if you do struggle in this area, do make sure you try and answer all of the different parts of the question. It can often go on for quite a long time, because your tutor will still give you credit if you have attempted to answer the question and are able to demonstrate a knowledge of the rules relating to tracing. Well, that's all from me. If you did like this video, then make sure to leave a like below, and subscribe for more videos in the future, and if any questions, then drop those in the comments and I'll try and get back to you. Alright, bye!